uh, two from the plane, two from the sphere, except these are parallel, and uh, three from the plane and one from the sphere. That's just a review. I went through and, you know, I rushed over the details of that, but uh, go back to that previous lecture. You can see those are the four ways with, with a little more conditions on how you have to pick them. And we went, we went through the four different options in the past and came up with things that uh, all the different ways you could do this or visualize how you could do it with wires and, and blades, okay? But now, say we can use a nub. Well, remember, nub flexures can be modeled most effectively. And remember this nub, maybe it's not, it would be best modeled if it was like two opposing cones that were really small right here because then it really follows the freedom space. But in reality, you know, it's good enough. It'll, it'll behave like this and its constraint space is essentially a sphere. So what you would do is you would use the sub-constraint space. The only sub-constraint space that's compatible with um, a sphere is the one where we're saying pick three things from the sphere that don't all lie in the same plane and one from the plane. Okay, remember the only one that was compatible, if you go back, the only one that was compatible with a dip, or sorry, a, um, a, uh, a, a blade flexor is this one, three from the plane and one from the sphere. The three from the plane, that's like a blade flexor can be taken from this subconstraint space, okay? These subconstraint spaces, this one and this one, remember, we, because of these, these things, we could use those V blade flexors in these. So you could use other designs with the V blade flexors on the on this one from this sphere and this one, okay, from this subconstraint space. But if we go back to this subconstraint space, this can now access anything that has a, free, a constraint space of a sphere, which are all these things and many more you could have used. But we asked for a nub flexure, so we're going to take the nub flexure, put its center right here, and then take a wire flexure and connect it to it, okay? And here is an example where you say this is ground, there's your nub flexure, here's the ground, here's the wire flexure, and it should, again, achieve tip and tilt. Now, it's a horrible design, and, and there's, there's a number of things that aren't great about it. Okay? First of all, the center of this is the center of the sphere, and so this wire should be on the same plane as that center. And in this case, it's not. It's, it's on the plane just above it. So in reality, what that would do is that would create a the same freedom space, a disk of, of rotations that's centered here but lopsided on the plane that goes through the center of that and this wire. And so it would be like lopsided. So that's not good. You could either lower this wire down and put something there or, you know, if you want it to be, to be flat. That's one thing to keep in mind. But it's, it's just not a good design anyway. You wouldn't want to use a nub for this. Um, and uh, it's just it's not clean with this with this wire, right? But it is exactly constrained here. You have three independent ones from here, and you have one independent one from there, and so it's it's you get your four non-redundant ones. It's exactly constrained, but it's just it's not a good design. But anyway, that, that's just an exercise to show you that uh, we get more parallel designs than I showed you in that previous lecture when we allow ourselves to use things other than just wires and blades. We can use nubs. We could use all those things. We could use V flexors. There's there's all sorts of things we could use. Okay. So there's many more designs you could consider. And, and, and like I said, they're worth considering. There, there might be some golden design in there that's really cool that could be made with this, um, with these neat elements, okay? Okay. Okay, so now I'm going to do a little excursion and talk about um, rigid body elements. I know this class is focused entirely on compliant mechanisms and things, but I just want to show you that what I have taught you thus far is, um, uh, you know, can be applied to any rigid mechanism as well. Some of you took my 162A class on mechanisms before, and you're wondering, you know, uh, and, and that class didn't really talk too much about designing rigid mechanisms, um, but whether you realize it or not, by taking this class, you are, I've, I've already kind of taught you how to design rigid mechanism by teaching you how to design compliant mechanisms and I hope to show you how one in this section but in future sections um, uh, how, to, how, to, how to do you know what the connection is there right so so right now I, I've only taught you in this course how to design parallel systems really and parallel elements which are basically just two rigid bodies joined together by something that guides the motions of those two rigid bodies. That in rigid land is basically what we call a joint or a pair. We just have two rigid bodies that join the two rigid bodies. 
um, and constrain them to, for instance, the prism joint just rotates, the translational joint, uh, you know, or sorry, a, a revolute joint just rotates and a prism joint just translates, right? Um, and there's helical joints and there's all kinds of rigid joints, um, but, but really all they're doing is, is constraining two bodies to not move in some directions while allowing them to move in other directions. So, so, so far, if you've understood everything I've taught you, um, you already kind of know how to design both compliant and rigid joints is all, okay? But when I t talk about serial and hybrid, you'll know how to design any mechanism, both compliant and rigid, okay? But this is going to be a key thing to bridge in your mind how you leap from compliant to rigid joints using freedom and constraint space pairs, okay? So, um, so consider this, this, this uh, here's one body that's basically a, a, a half sphere, and then here's another body that's, that's like a, a rectangular prism, right? And we just set these on top of each other, okay? How do you model their constraint? That, that is a joint. We have two distinct bodies, and we've set them on top of each other and join them together, okay? And they do provide certain constraint, okay? Well, here's the rule, okay? Here's the conditions that need to be satisfied to find what constraint space models the rigid one, okay? With, 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 with compliant elements, it's easy. You, you find the blue lines that uh, connect the two and pass entirely through the geometry without exiting it, and you do that with all of them and linearly combine them, and now you have the constraint space, right? But with rigid bodies, what you do is, is you do what this says up on the top here. The interaction between two rigid surfaces impose constraint lines that, one, are normal to each surface, and two, pass directly through the interaction of, of, the rigid, of both rigid surfaces from one to the next. So, so what's this saying? This is saying, like, okay, so you, you take this half-sphere surface. Think of all the blue lines that are normal to that surface. So it's like basically like a starburst, basically like the sphere with with uh, blue lines radiating out there perpendicular to the surface, okay? Then you could think of, well, okay, let's look at this, this surface that's just a flat. So think of all the blue lines that come out of that perpendicular and it'd be like a box of blue lines, right? Okay, so now you've found uh, uh, the lines that are normal to each surface, okay? But now you've got to find the ones that are common and pass through each other. So for instance, the blue line that comes out normal is this goes through air before it hits this one, and it certainly doesn't hit it at a normal angle. So you, you can't consider that one. The only blue line that is the overlap of both of those, you know, the, 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 the ones coming directly, well, and by the way, ones coming directly straight down from this go through air, don't even hit this. Well, if they do, maybe they hit it over here. But they go through air, and they don't hit it at a normal angle. So the only, the only blue lines that pass directly through both, okay, that are normal to both, um, is this single blue line from those two, two sets of blue lines, okay? And that's the one that models it, okay? So you always think of the surface of both, think of the blue lines that are perpendicular radiating out of those surfaces at normal degree angles, and find the, basically the intersection or, or the, the ones that are common between both that pass through their elements that are perpendicular, and you will find this nice uh, blue line for this one, okay? So that's like the rigid equivalent of a wire flexure, okay, uh, right? Now again, you could say, well, it certainly constrains it in compression along this axis, and it certainly doesn't constrain it with the other five degrees of freedom, but you could say, but there's a problem, this also, this doesn't constrain it in tension, which is break off, but remember, if you took my mechanism class, you're not allowed to break joints. It's an idealized thing that uh, you're not allowed to break joints. You assume they're kind of preloaded together or something. Right, so, so um, and it, it's, it's very similar to wires. If they were a perfect wire that really is modeled by a single blue line, then they would be so thin, they really couldn't resist things in tension or compression, but certainly not in compression. Even, even practical wires sometimes are so thin that they're, they start behaving like string, and they, they don't resist compression. But you just pretend they do, right, for the theory. Okay, just like you pretend these can never be broken. Okay, so, so this is the rigid equivalence of a wire flexure, okay, okay, joint. And it has an order of constraint of one, and its freedom space is this. It will achieve all the red rotation lines in this, these intersecting planes and the perpendicular translation and all these screws, okay. So, so you, can, and you can see that. You can see it could translate perpendicular, it could rotate in all the different directions. 
you know, rotation here, rotation here, rotation there, and translate in those directions. All it couldn't do was translate up and down here without breaking the joint, okay? And it could do all the other things in the freedom space. Okay, now let's look at a flat, a cylinder on a flat, okay? So if you get a cylinder and you think of what are all the blue lines that radiate from the cylinder, well, you think that's basically like a bunch of disks that are all parallel to each other. And then you think, well, what's the, what are all the blue lines that come from this flat? Well, again, it's like a box of blue lines. But now you ask yourself, what are the ones that they share in common that pass through each other that are perpendicular to all of them? What's the intersection of those two sets? Well, it's just a plane of parallel blue lines. That, that is the constraint space of this joint, this rigid joint interaction. And you've already memorized how many independent things are in this. Well, it's two, so it's an order of constraint of two. And you could look up its constraint space is this and its freedom space is this, okay? Which has four independent motions in it, okay? Which, you, sorry, you could see here is, you know, can you rotate there? Yes, you can. Okay, can you rotate up there? Yes, you could. Can you rotate there? No, you couldn't. It would, like, be constrained there without breaking the joint. Okay, could you translate in this direction? Yes, you could. Unless there's friction. Again, assume there's no friction. You, you assume these are frictionless. Um, if they have a lot of friction, you could start considering those constraints and then they'd be modeled differently, right? But you assume they're smooth surfaces with no friction and they're just resisted by mass not being able to pass through mass, right? Okay, but anyway, so you can translate there. You could translate in and out of the page, but you couldn't translate here or rotate here. And you'd see that that is this space, okay? You get all those motions I just described without the motions I said that are constrained, and you get out the combination of all these other ones. And of course, there are screws in there too, okay? And this is not oriented. Well, no, it is oriented correctly. This is the correct orientation, okay? So you see translation there, translation there, rotation there, rotation there, but not rotation out and not translation up. Okay. So now say you have a flat on a flat, okay? This is like putting a book or something on uh, the wall, okay? Or, or, or say uh, an eraser or something on, on the plane, okay? Which I'll, I'll do here in a minute, but l let's find out what the constraint space is. I mean, I've obviously drawn it, but um, think of all the blue lines that come out perpendicular to this surface and this surface. Well, they'll both be a box, and so what's common between both? Well, it's a box. So the box is the constraint space. It's an order of constraint of three, and what is its freedom space? Well, the order of constraint of three. Its freedom space is also a box with perpendicular translation arrows in a disk. Okay, so think about it. Um, if I say, you know, here's a flat, and say I put it on this flat page, Okay, it's, it's constrained. Say I'm not allowed to break the joint and take it off. What are all the ways it could move? Well, it could move, uh, it could translate anywhere in the plane. That's the disk of translations here. And it could rotate around any axis coming out of the plane. It could rotate there. It could rotate there. It could rotate there. Anywhere I put a, a, my finger, it could rotate about. Okay, with no problem. Okay, so, so that's, that should convince you that when you put a flat on flat, this is indeed uh, the, the freedom space, okay? All right, let, let's look at another uh, rigid uh, interface, uh, you know, s sliding, wearing contact between these two, two rigid bodies, okay? Um, say a, uh, a ball and a cup, okay, or a spherical joint, okay? Then what, what you, what, so you say, well, what is, what is the uh, in, in interaction here? Well, you think of all the blue lines that are normal to the, the sphere, those, those radii out in like kind of a sphere is shown like this, and you think of all the things that are normal to the cup, it's the same thing. So what's common between both of them? What, is, what passes through them both directly and you know, is uh, perpendicular to all of them? Well, it's the same, it's a sphere, okay? And therefore, its order of constraint is three, and not surprisingly, its freedom space is also a sphere, okay? Which means it can, rotate here, it can rotate there, it can rotate, it can do all the rotations with no translations, okay, which is what we already know to be the case. Okay, so let's look at this one. Say we just have, this is a classic uh, joint, we have two rigid bodies, you have a cylinder and a sleeve, okay, and uh, you know, those are the two rigid bodies colored differently, um, and this, the question is what is the system's constraint space and then what is its freedom space, 
Okay, well, you can, you can obviously visualize how this is going to move. It's, it's trivial. This is why um, it's not good to teach fact with rigid joints because they're so obvious a lot of times that like you don't even need fact. It's much more useful to teach them and there's many more examples and there's many more joint types that are much more interesting um, where you absolutely need fact. Okay, But, um, but, but it's, it's useful to come back from highly complex things to simple things and show uh, different perspectives on these things that you thought was obvious but there's, there's some insights that aren't obvious. Okay. So you could visualize this one could obviously translate and it could obviously rotate and of course they can do those two independently so you could do any screw with any pitch in there as well. So you know that's how it moves. But what's its constraint space? Well, again, think of that rule. Think of all the blue lines that come out perpendicular to this curved cylinder surface and they'd be a bunch of disks that, that are parallel. Then think of all the blue lines that come out from this surface and they'd be the same disks. So the thing that's common between them both are these disks. That is the constraint space, a bunch of parallel disks. And you could look this up and you would find there. Okay. Now you might say, well, what about this one? This one, this, this constraint space above it, by the way, is a bunch of disks and they are parallel. They all lie on parallel planes. But the line that pierces through the center of all the disks, this dashed line, um, on this one is not perpendicular or, or orthogonal to the plane of all those disks. Those disks are all kind of cocked back at a weird angle on, in type 9 of 2D, 2DF type 9. But in 2DF type 8, all those disks are not only parallel, but the line that pierces them is also perpendicular to their planes, okay, which is indeed the case uh, here. Okay, and so we know that's the constraint space and therefore the freedom space is this which we see as two degrees of freedom and, and is indeed translations, rotations, and then the linear combination of those, which is any screw of any pitch. Okay? Okay, so once you know that, what if we're going to do an exercise and say, um, you know, use the same constraint space, using the same constraint space, can you generate a new rigid body bearing that achieves the same rotation translation shown in the freedom space Okay, but let's say that has a lot less friction. So say a company hired you to consult and they said, we, you know, this, this does the job we want. We want to achieve a rotation. We want to achieve a translation. And we want to achieve all these screws, just like this does. But the interface here, there's a lot of friction here. And that friction is not repeatable. It's, it's killing our precision. We don't want to flexure. We don't want to comply. We don't need that kind of precision but we do want to get better precision than what we're getting. Can you help us? Well, sure, that would be a perfect example of fact. What you do is you'd say, well, I know that this is the constraint space, and since there's two things in here, six minus two is four, we need to pick four independent things from here, at least, and then anything other than that is redundant, and, and will uh, provide you know, extra contact and friction and kill your, kill your um, uh, you know, your, your precision. Well, this could be one solution. Instead of what you could do is have three um, axisymmetric cylinders spaced each uh, by 60 degrees um, that this, this rides in. And, and what this would be is the interface between this cylinder and that cylinder would be a plane of parallel blue lines. And the same thing with this one and this one. So you have three planes of intersecting parallel blue lines that would, of course, add up to this constraint space and therefore, of course, achieve that. But the nice thing is, is you'd see it only touches, instead of it, an entire surface at three lines. Okay? And this is over-constrained. We over-constrained it because in reality, you'd want to surround it with points that are spaced, you know, you know, uh, as, as, you know this, this wouldn't break in, you know, if I pulled up or down. Um, if you really wanted to get even less friction with cylinder-on-cylinder -cylinder contact, you could just have these two get rid of this one and have it flip it upside down so gravity is kind of pulling it down. And now it's basically a cylinder sitting on two cylinders and now it's just touching on two lines and has even less friction. And again, it still has the number of independent blue lines you need. You'd have, you'd have two intersecting blue lines or blue planes of parallel lines where each of them contains two independent wrenches. So you'd have two intersecting planes of parallel blue lines um, where they each have two independent blue things. And so you'd have two plus two is four and it would still be enough to get this constraint space and get that motion. 
Okay? The downside to that design is you could break the joint in practice and lift it off. Okay? Now, to get even less friction, you could even go in there and say, look, what if I want sphere on cylinder contact? So could I, almost the best design would be take four spheres, right? T take just four spheres, two here, two there, and set your cylinder on top. And now that is an exactly constrained rigid design, okay? The, the, the interface between cylinder on sphere, um, the, 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 you know, the model is just a single blue line where they touch and normal to both of them. And so if you just have four spheres or half spheres and you lay the cylinder on top, then you will get the, uh, it, you won't have any over constraint. It'll just be four non-redundant constraints that lie in these, uh, in two different uh, disks would probably be the better way to do it. And you would still get this thing as long as you don't break the joint. Now, if you wanted to put something around it, you could put uh, two more on the top. And so that would really lock it in and be, like this, except there would be two uh, half sphere here, half sphere here, half sphere here, half sphere here, then a half sphere here. Now you might just do one half sphere, but again, that might uh, rock because you can break joints and stuff. So, so, um, but anyway, these principles can help you understand. Um, of course, just the four sphere solution is the lowest friction, best way to achieve exact constraint, most precision for a rigid system that achieves this freedom space. Okay, and they may not know that if you c consult with you. And then the more contact you get, the less, the more friction, the less exactly constrained it is, uh, et cetera. You know, but there may be advantages. Like for instance, this one is much easier to fabricate because it's just a planar extrusion. You could wire EDM or water jet out. It, it would be cheaper to the company to do this. So if, if this works, it holds it just fine. Uh, and maybe there's enough, there's, low enough friction in this that it, it does their job in, in the cheapest way. So you got to use your common sense and the trade-offs of fabrication and all these principles I've taught you about exact and over constraint and precision stuff to get uh, to consult with companies on this well. Okay, so <clears throat> all right, so let's look at um, let's look at the, the these designs are kind of um, are, these are famous uh, hinges or joints in rigid land, rigid mechanism land, that uh, achieved rotations, translations, and screws. So this is just a revolute joint, okay? And it's, it's basically you've got, you know, these two cylinders and this cylinder, and then you put it in there and you put like a cylinder in between there. So there's like a, this is kind of a sleeve, and this cylinder slides through. And you can see that's a very nice door hinge or something that just achieves a nice rotation. Okay, and that's obvious if you look at it, but if you look at it in freedom and constraint space land, um, think about it, it's, it's actually not so obvious, okay? So the interface between the, the light gray and the, and, the, and the dark gray part, you have to ask yourself, what are all the blue lines that um, extend from both those surfaces? Well, let's just look at the c cylinder inside the sleeve. Those make, the, the interface between those will be a bunch of parallel disks like we showed before. But then the interface from this thing to that and this thing to that are two boxes of parallel blue lines coming in this way. Okay? And those are all arranged in parallel, so you add those together. If you have a bunch of parallel blue lines coming this way and a bunch of disks with blue lines radiating out and you add them together, what you'll get is a bunch of intersecting blue planes that intersect at the, you know, at this red line. So it will be, that, that, that proves that it will be a, um, a single rotation, okay? So very obvious um, just by looking at it, but not obvious to analyze what the constraint space is and why that's what the constraint space is, okay? A again, this is, this is now, um, if you take any polygon that's not, you know, if, if you take a circle and put it in a sleeve, then it'll do uh, rotation and translation. But if you take any other polygon and put it in a sleeve, in this case it's a square, it will kill the rotation and the screw, uh, the screws, but it will leave just the translation. And this is a classic, you know, prism translational joint that just to see, receive, you know, achieves a single degree of freedom. And that's obvious. But, but it's not so obvious, again, to analyze the constraint space. So if you think, what is the interface between this light gray and this dark gray on this side that, that, that satisfies those rigid conditions, 
um, from previously is that it's a box of parallel blue lines that are going in like this, and on the other side it's the same box. But then on this side it's another box going this way, and on this side it's another box going that side. That's what they all share in common. So it's a bunch of boxes, you know, two orthogonal boxes of uh, blue uh, constraint lines that are perpendicular to the interface here. And if you add those together, you'll get a bunch of stacked blue parallel planes. And, and that constraint space stacked blue parallel planes right here. So what, what I'm saying is I'm adding two of these perpendicular to each other. All the blue lines on each plane will add together and make this stacked blue plane. And so its freedom space is the translation. That's why it achieves uh, this translation. Now, the screw is actually the, one of the coolest to think about. So, um, you know, of course, inside the light gray part, there's threads that have been tapped in it. Okay, it's been tapped. And then on the actual screw, there's, there's threads in it. But the question is, why does the screw actually achieve a screwing motion? Or a, a, this is a helical joint in rigid mechanism land. Um, if you've got like a, a body attached to this and a body attached to this and they're, they're moving together, they will rotate and translate with a very specific pitch, which is defined by the thread uh, pitch, uh, obviously. Okay, but the question is why does a screw screw, okay, with a certain pitch? Well, the reason is, is because it's constraint, if you, if you do those conditions, if you find all the blue lines that are normal to all the threads on this one, the radiate out from that and normal to all the threads on this one, the radiate out from that normally, and you find what are common, what's the intersection between those spaces, then what you'll find is blue lines that lie within the constraint space of this green screw, which is there, there are blue lines that lie within circular hyperboloids that gradually lower their way down. I, I need to show an animation of this uh, one day. Um, maybe, probably on my YouTube channel, show, show uh, you know, all the blue lines that satisfy the rigid conditions I gave you in previous slides for the threads between these two interactions. And you'll find they all lie within the constraint space of this screw, which is why it even achieves a screw. Okay, so I'm just, the whole point of this slide is to show you things that you think are obvious, that you take for granted, um, you know, and it's easy to visualize their motions but to show you that they actually correspond with constraint spaces that are not as obvious to identify. Um, but they do indeed, all joints, whether rigid or compliant, have freedom and constraint spaces. And if you have the knowledge I've taught you in this course, you can use those constraint spaces to design other joints, either rigid or compliant, that will achieve the motion you want and consider things of precision, um, uh, you know, uh, applicability as, as well as other, other things that you might care about, okay? Uh, like all the constraint-based design principles I've, I've taught you, okay? So this, this course... Uh, parallel, you know, any joint that j takes two rigid bodies and joins them together, whether it be a rigid sliding contact joint or a magnetic air or air bearing joint, um, or any other kind of bearing, uh, particularly flexure bearings. I hope you're masters of those. Those are the most interesting and the most versatile and the most diverse with the most different solutions. Um, you know how to design those and, and join them together uh, so that they're a parallel joint and gets the motion you want, okay? And um, in future lectures, I'm going to show you how to do the, stack these joints in series and in, and, and in hybrid to get uh, actual mechanisms that are are uh, compliant or rigid um, with any bearing type, okay, so which is almost essentially any mechanical system that's not fluids or thermal. Um, so any, any mechanical system with moving parts you can design using this fact theory. Okay, so um, now we're going to look at synthesizing rigid body systems, okay? So just do an example here and then we'll, we'll wrap up um, with this topic, okay? Um, here is a uh, CT scanner, okay? Say we wish to analyze the bearings that guide the rotating hoops of a CT scanner machine. So someone lays on here, goes in this hole, and uh, there's, these, there's these hoops, okay? These big metal hoops um, that rotate around, okay, with magnets and, and fancy stuff that um, 
can image, uh, you know, what, what's inside your brain, and 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 uh, and, and uh, the doctors can use, right? So, but but that's not what interests us.